it was so exciting that we were inventing this stuff and it was so fun to keep like developing new stuff in this incredible circle that kept happening and i just and 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 our whole philosophy was that the, that the technology is never going to entertain an audience by itself. Mm. It's what you do with the technology. One of, one of the greatest moments in my career at Disney, the, there was one animator in particular that became probably my closest mentor, and it was Ollie Johnston. And I would go in to, to his office. I was working on this scene. <coughs> And, um, and he would flip it. And he did this to a number of the young animators. Glenn Keane tells, you know, would say, tell me that he did this to him too. But he would flip, flip, flip the scene and he'd look at it. And to me, my, my, my drawing was fairly weak. My, my brain, I knew what I wanted the animation to be, but I just couldn't get the drawings to work. And I would go in to see if he could help me with drawing and I was so focused on the drawing. And he would look at it and he goes, John, what's the character thinking? And I, I go, the character thinking. He never, ever, 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 ever thought about the drawings. It was always the character. He was always looking past the character, looking deeper you know, through it and into it, and it was, a character was always alive to him. And he always said that the, the characters, all of the characters' actions are driven by that character's thought process. So you have to be clear as to what the character is thinking before you can ever make him move. And, and also then he would say, well, what's his emotional state? Because he would say, you know, a character would move completely differently in two different emotional states. You know, I could, I could pick people and we could walk upstairs together and everybody walks upstairs differently. And it defines a character, you know, these simple movements. And then you have a character, you know, sort of like, sometimes you want to have a character do emotion, you know, some sort of action, and then when you see him do the action in a different emotional state, he'll do it completely differently. Case in point, when you go to the exhibit and you see the short film Luxo Jr., there's a little baby lamp, the, the Luxo Jr. character, and he hops. He, you know, when, he, when he's hopping, chasing the ball, he's so excited and happy. He can barely spend any time on the ground. He, he's hopping forward. At a certain point, he pops the ball, and he's really sad. And he hops out, but it's a completely different hop because he's just really mm. sad. He hops and he spends a lot more time on the ground in between hops. And it's so clear, he's sad. There's no dialogue. In fact, there's no faces on these characters. But there's every single person who watches it will say, he's happy here, he's sad here. And, and it's... It's that kind of thing that, that, that Ollie was talking about. What's the character thinking? And it was so kind of profound. And that's what I would kept talking to the, the, you know, the guys at Lucasfilm about story and character and all like that. And I was successfully brainwashed every single one of them <laughs> to say the thing that they love the most is not as important as the story and the characters. Mm. The technology is always in service of the story and the characters. If we make films, if we get a chance to make a feature film, that's what's going, that's what's going to entertain the audience. And then you, and then you got that chance with Toy Story, right? Yeah. yeah. We did, um, in the beginning of, of uh, the existence of Pixar, we were the, uh, the, the Lucasfilm Computer Division uh, existed from 1979 to 1986. Um, there was about 40 people in the Lucasfilm Computer Division. And it's a pretty remarkable moment in history that people don't quite know about. Ed Catmull was hired by George Lucas, and George Lucas funded it with his own money, um, the belief that computer technology could come into filmmaking and, and really you know, be able to make things better. And so that group of 40 people during those years did four projects. Three of them George asked, asked um, Ed to, to develop 
and, and Ed brought the, the fourth one. Digital nonlinear film editing, um, if you know Final Cut Pro or the Avid, it's a predecessor to that, what made that possible. Um, digital sound editing, anybody who does Pro Tools, or any kind of digital sound editing. The digital compositing of images to replace the optical printer. I mean, our phones can do that now. And, and 3D computer animation. Those things didn't exist before 1979. And that 40 people, led by Ed Catmull, invented those four things during that period of time, which is really remarkable. And that story is really never told. And, and so we, we went to, um, and so then Steve Jobs came into our life, and he purchased our group, the 40 of us, from Lucasfilm in February of 1986 when we founded Pixar. So one of the things that Ed Catmull, who was you know, the president um, of the company, wanted to do is, is there was a computer, there was not much going on in computer animation at the time, and there was um, one conference called SIGGRAPH that still exists, but it was where everything was happening. It was like, you know, it's so funny to have like thousands of pasty white nerds coming out of their basements to party their brains out for one week a year, and then they go back in their basements, you know, to, you know, dark, dark rooms to develop this stuff. But it was so exciting because so much invention was happening and it all was shown there. And so they had this film show that was like a rock concert, and, and so Ed wanted to have, to, you know, something to show, you know, in our first year in 1986 as Pixar, and that's, and, and that's when I created Luxo Jr. We did a series of short films during those years. Um, and in fact, when, when Nancy and I got together, she moved out during Luxo Jr. Red's Dream, we were recording. We got married um, during Tin Toy, Tin Toy, and we had our first baby during Nick Knack. That's how I know those, those years. <laughs> <clears throat> and I did, it's, it's funny, I did, um, you know, during that time for those we would get started and we start making the films from about February till about May. The deadline for SIGGRAPH to deliver was generally like early June. You had to get the films in um, to there. And so I would, and we, the animation department had like two computers and, you know, I would take the midnight shift, you know, I'd work through the night. And so I actually had a futon under my desk and those, those you know, from 84, yeah, 84, 85, 86, 87, 88, 89. I, during the springtime, I basically stayed at work and worked through the night. Even as we got married and had our first baby, I was doing this, you know, to build, you know, to, and, and it was because I loved it, and it was, it was building this, this new art form and working towards the, you know, building this, this company. And, um, and so Nancy would show up with clean laundry, and she'd make meatloaf for me, and, come up and it was so it was so cute and stuff and I just <laughs> it was so much fun you know and I'd come home usually once a week to come home and, and stuff but um, but we'd work really hard you know, during this time to do these films and it was all working towards doing a feature film and and um, one of the first contracts Pixar had as a separate company from Lucasfilm <clears throat> was to do a digital ink and paint system for Disney they call it the CAPS system. And, um, and so it started our relationship with Disney. And they kept trying to hire me back because it was the new Jeffrey Katzenberg, uh, Michael Eisner, Roy Disney, Frank Wells were all back at the, the Disney studio and they were bringing animation back. And they always saw me as someone that, that they had kind of let lost and let go so they kept trying to hire me back every time I finished one of the short films I get another call trying to hire me back and um, and so it really got to a point where you know we I wasn't making very much money at all Nancy I had a salary freeze for the whole 80s I was making the same amount of money the entire time Nancy was working at Apple um, I have to give my my incredible wife in the history of, of computer animation. She, she was the very first person ever to do 3D computer animation on a Macintosh. She was in the advanced research group at Apple Computer. She worked her way through Carnegie Mellon University as a single mom on welfare and then got a job at Apple. And her group um, invented 
and she didn't invent QuickTime, but her group invented QuickTime in, in that time period. And she, she utilized it by doing so this computer animation. And to prove the Macintosh was, was a, real, a real computer that you could really do something with. And uh, that was in 1988. And so I, the, the same year I did Tin Toys, she was doing this incredible groundbreaking work at a Apple at the same time. And we had gotten married, and we didn't have much of a honeymoon. We always said we would catch up on the honeymoon. <clears throat> but now we're empty nesters, so we can. Woo! <laughs> 35, e 30, 35 years of, of, of kids. We can do it, honey. We can go on our honeymoon. Um, but we, uh, but it, it was so exciting during that time period because there was so much invention going on. The cigarette was so exciting. But it got to a place where it's like Ed and I looked at each other and said, let's, let's, let's do our dream. Let's work towards doing a feature film. And so finally we kept, and Steve Jobs really helped out with Disney and said, instead of trying to hire John away, just let him make a movie at Pixar. And the thing that made it, and Disney always said, no, every animated feature film with a Disney name on it will be made by Disney. End of story. What changed was, was bless Tim Burton's heart, my dear friend who I went to college with. He had done, um, when, I, when I was doing the Wild Things test and developing Toaster, right across the hall from him, he was doing this puppet animated film called Vincent and he had developed a feature film just like me to utilize that technology. It was called The Nightmare Before Christmas. It was an original idea that he'd come up with. And then he left um, to do Pee Wee Herman and all, all that, you know, and, and his career just, you know, Beetlejuice and all like that, it just exploded. It was great, he's so talented. But he always wanted Nightmare Before Christmas back from Disney. And so Disney said, why don't you make it for us? And so at that point in time, he had enough clout to where he called his own shots. I wanted puppet animated, and we're going to set up um, a studio up in San Francisco, which they did. And Henry Selleck, he, he picked as his director, and he, they created um, Nightmare Before Christmas up there. And it was the first time an animated film made, and Disney justified it by saying it's a different technique than cell animation, which was their bread and butter would be made in, by somebody else but released by Disney. That opened the door for us. Then they came to us and said, we're doing this puppet anima animation with Tim Burton. Now we're, we're ready to talk to you about doing a computer animated film with you guys. Because we had been working on them for a long time. Every time they would call me to try to hire me back, it's just let me make a film for you up here. And they go, no. And finally they said, OK, we're interested in doing that. Come back when you have an idea. So we came, we were like looking at each other, Andrew Stanton, Pete Doctor, Joe Ramp, and myself were saying like, you know, and, and we always said, we had did, done the short film Tin Toy, which was the first computer animated film to win an Oscar for animated short film in 1988. And it was about toys being alive. And we always thought that the idea of toys being alive was the perfect, perfect um, kind of subject for computer animation. Because we were in the really, really, really unique, um, unique opportunity and unique position that we had invented much of computer animation. And we knew what computer, computer animation could do really well, its, its strengths. And we also knew what its weaknesses were. You know, it, it liked doing things very geometric. Anything that was really organic was really hard for the computer to do. Um, and it tended, the renderers back then tended to make everything look kind of like plastic. And so toys was the perfect subject matter for that. We knew it because toys are man-made. They're pretty much geometric. Um, and toys are made of plastic. So it worked perfectly for the renderer. You know, humans were really hard. And that's why we, you know, Andy, his mom, and Molly were really kind of like you didn't har you hardly see them, you know. They were, they were off, off, you know, it was just feet and hands and stuff like that, just uh, because, because they were really hard to do. And they, you know, you know Toy Story's awesome, but those humans are a little, <laughs> eesh, you know, you know, just look past them. It's, you know, it's not about them anyway, you know, it's the toys. And then, but also the great thing is, 
And we thought, toys are in kids' rooms. Kids' rooms have completely flat floors, straight walls, geometric. This is awesome. So we really leaned in. And that's why, you know, it, it, it just knowing the limitations of your art and your medium and then being creative and saying, let's lean into those limitations and do what it does really, really well. And that's what Toy Story was. And, you know, it was so exciting when we were making this, this movie. And so we, we pitched the idea to Disney. And one of the things that as we were trying to figure out um, Toy Story, the, the, um, what the story was going to be. It was kind of a long evolution to this. We made a list, actually, of what we didn't want, um, what we didn't want the movie to be. We, we didn't want it to be like what Disney was doing so well. right? They, they had the corner on the musical. They were doing Little Mermaid, Aladdin, Beauty and the Beast, Lion King, right in that time frame. And they were just nailing it, and they were great. And we were like, we're not gonna, we don't want to do that. We want to do something more contemporary, something different, something that, that felt, you know, a different type of story. And then, and then we discovered um, the genre of the buddy picture. Mm. Um, and it had never been done in animation before. And what we were looking for was simply, we wanted our main character to be the most interesting character in the film. Disney tended to, to, to not want to ever make their characters flawed, their main characters, like Aladdin. Aladdin is one of my favorite animated films. But, you know, the Aladdin character himself is, is kind of the, the most boring character in the movie when Jafar and the genie and, yeah. and the, you know, all the other characters are brilliant because they're all deeply flawed. You know, and so we said, we want to have a flawed main character. And then when we discovered the buddy picture, it's like by nature, the main character grows tremendously. A buddy picture is where you have two characters that are as opposite as possible, and some situation causes them to be forced to be together beyond their choice. They don't want to be together. And through the, through the association and the adventure of being forced together, they grow tremendously to the point where where they, all they want to do is be together. They love each other so much. And we just love that idea of, of this growth. And so it fit perfectly in the idea of toys being alive because we, we said, well, what if we had an old toy that was a child's favorite and, and a new toy on his birthday? There's two days a year that the, the, the toys fear the mo most, birthdays and Christmas, because new toys come in, become the kid's new favorite, and they get relegated to the bottom of the toy boxes with the Happy Meal toys. You know, <laughs> they smell like hamburgers all the time. And, and so we, we, we had this idea, you know, and, and it just really started blossoming. And, and, you know, Toy Story was born. And so we did Toy Story from 1991 through 1995, and it was released in Thanksgiving of 1995. And like Snow White, became the highest grossing film of the year, right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, seen by everyone, not just uh, kids. Right, right. So, so the belief that we all had, you know, that animation was for everybody, you know, happened. And we, we kind of, and, and Disney had helped by, by, by really bringing animation back for everybody with Little Mermaid and, mm -hmm. and you know, all those films. But this just came out, and, and we didn't want it to be a musical. On our list of what we didn't want it to be, we didn't want it to be a musical. And I'll never forget this, um, <laughs> this uh, Disney, Disney development executive uh, who was helping us in the beginning, uh, who was just basically following the orders of her, her bosses. And she came up once and she sat down, we were developing the story, and she said, okay, now we need to talk about where the, the six to eight Songs are going to go. <laughs> With a clipboard. And we went, and my son, I remember we were, it was me and Andrew and Joe and Joe Ramft and Pete Doctor. We looked at each other and said, we're actually kind of thinking about not having any songs in it. <laughs> oh my goodness. Her face just turned pure white. And she was like, 
I knew what was going on in her head. It's like, what am I going to say to them? They're going to fire me. What am I going to say? <laughs> and and one of my, uh, what became one of my, my dearest, dearest friends came in and saved the day. He was the, the, the executive music producer, the VP of music for Disney, uh, the Disney studio. Chris Montan came in and sat with us. And he explained to me and to us how actually songs can really... Um, really give you, uh, give the audience a, a really strong emotion that even just dialogue and stuff can't. It just can really, really um, add emotion and, and, and further the character's development really well. And, and so he came back with a great idea where we looked at, um, we looked at two movies um, and how, how songs were used. Uh, the Graduate, and Simon and Garfunkel had, they had written songs specifically for the movie, and they were played in the movie in a particular you know, place and time. But they were sung by Simon and Garfunkel. It was sung by somebody else. But you, you, it worked. You got it. Also, um, Harold and Maude with Cat Stevens. It was the same mm -hmm. thing. And so we, we actually then turned around, and, and he, he, great, he made up a name that sounded so good that the head of the studio would never admit he didn't, he didn't know what it meant because he didn't want to show that he, he didn't know anything. But he, and so it was cohesive song, song score. It was like, we're going to do a cohesive song score. He's like. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good, yeah. you know? Yeah, so, yeah sure, I, I know this, you know, <laughs> like that. And Chris had made it up, you know, just to make it sound official. But, but anyway, we, we went to Randy Newman. And to, because he did be beautiful scores, but also he wrote uh, really songs. funny songs as well as really emotional songs. And so that started our, our long friendship and association with Randy Newman. And so Toy Story actually had three songs in it that you can't imagine Toy Story without these songs. And so it was something. So we were, it was really exciting during that time because we were so learning so much. And, and it's really, really exciting to do something no one else had ever done before in history because we did not know what we didn't know. And that was a really wonderful thing. And John, is it hard? How is it? I, I keep thinking, when you tell me stories about these amazing people in a room just having a conversation about that movie, how is it, how is it today at Pixar? Are you able to capture that same oh, sort yeah. of magic? But I, I, how can you do it at that vast scale that you have now? You know, it's, it's still, the, the rooms are the same sizes with the same people, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, we have, we have lots of people there, but, but, but the, you know, we, when you're really working on a story, when you're really crafting a story, digging into the story and really doing it, you, you know, you don't have 1,200 people in the room, you, you, which is how many people we have at Pixar. You have the same kind of amount that we had at Toy Story. It's a small group, and, and the... The way that we evolved during Toy Story became the foundation of how we work as a creative organization. And it was interesting, when we started Toy Story, we were um, getting mandatory notes from Disney. And we would have to do the mandatory. We would have to do them. We had a, had a sheet we had to fill out of how you're going to address these notes and mm -hmm. send it back. And they had to approve how you were going to address these notes. And so we would do this. And we had gotten, uh, we had started working down and developing this idea. And there was an inherent fear from Disney, some, some, some of the executives at Disney, about if, it's a story about toys being played with by kids. What's in it for the adults? And they were really, really scared of that. So they kept using the word, make it edgy. <laughs> make it edgy. Make it edgy. You know, make it edgy, you know? And we're like... <laughs> Whatever. And so... But we kept doing that, and, kept, and, and we, we, we put together the first two acts of the film and story, really. We went down to, <laughs> to Disney, and um, we had made the, kept pushing and pushing the characters to be more and more and more edgy. And 
you know, we, 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 the, the screening room was full of people. We were showing it, and I was sitting in the back looking up going, this is not the movie I want to make. And it was a disaster. Woody was so repellent as a character. He was awful. He was mean. And he was, he was like the, the, he was, he was the, the leader. He was the, the Andy's favorite toy, and he was kicking everybody off the bed. He was not, you know, all this stuff. And it was like all, all trying to make it edgy. And, and it really was like, and they kind of, they, they, they basically walked out of there and they were, this is terrible. You know, and it's like, what, you know, this is, this is terrible. Yeah, what, what happened? How did, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, they're going to, what, what happened? And, you know, what we were doing was we were following notes the whole time. <laughs> you guys. Yeah, we didn't say that, of course, <laughs> but that's, that's what, luckily, you know, some of the, some of the, the, the sort of, executives that were really fantastic at Disney, that were really helping us out, they kind of said that to them, that they were following notes. And so, but they basically were going to, um, we had, right after that they got called us in, and they said, we're going to shut production down, you're going to lay everybody off, and you, we're going to move your entire story team down to Disney, because clearly you guys can't do it on your own. And um, we are going to um, work with you until we can get get the story, you know, story back on track and get what we like or else we're not going to make this movie. Nancy and I had just broken ground and building a new house. It was three weeks before Christmas. It was like, you know, it was, I never, I remember this sitting there going, you know, it's like that everything, all of our dreams and everything was just like ending right then and there. And you're like, and so I said, give us two weeks. Give us two weeks. It's right before Christmas. Just give us two weeks. Let us come back with something. And they were like really reluctant, but they said, okay. So we went back up, and it was the most profound thing. A fundamental change in, in, in the foundation of Pixar happened in these two weeks is we basically sort of trusted our instinct. We stopped listening to their notes. We only took the we like notes because we, we use the notes that make the movie better. We disregard, you know, any of the notes. And we just sat there and worked day and night all on the floor in front of storyboards together. And <clears throat> because we had we had at part of the Lucasfilm computer division had developed digital nonlinear editing, we were the very first animation studio to use the Avid because we believed in, in this technology. We knew that what, what it could do. And, and so because of that, we were able to turn around um, from, if you know Toy Story, from the beginning of the movie until Buzz Lightyear is in the room and flies around the room and lands, you know, and said, you got, I can fly around this room with your eye, my eyes open, you know, do it, okay. And he, he lands and he goes, can, you know. And, and from that point, you know, we, we came back with a story reel of that. In two weeks, we storyboarded that whole thing, rewrote it and storyboarded it the way we wanted to do it. <clears throat> and, and they had never seen anything turned around so fast like this. And it was so different. And it wasn't great because we made it even better since then, but it was good. It was what we wanted. It was the movie we wanted to have. Woody was a benevolent leader, but then something comes in and he just is pushed too far, you know? And, and that's what we wanted to show, you know, that, that someone who, who you liked, you know, the repellent Woody was you just didn't like him, and no matter what he did. And what we wanted is to have Woody be someone who you really liked, but then you go, don't do that, Woody, you know? Like that, that's, that's the feeling I wanted to have, that he was a flawed character, but he was flawed in a way that probably all of us would be. And, and it was someone that you could get behind and you could you go down his journey. And so, so we, we showed it to him and they were bl blown away by how, how good it was, but also how quickly we turned it around. And then they basically said, they, they said, okay, keep going. And so we, we basically, no one got laid off. We were able to not stop production. We were able to keep going. But we, we were so empowered for trusting our own instinct of doing what we 
fu fundamentally believed in. Because we were making, you know, at Pixar, we make movies the kind of movies we like to watch. It's not an auteur thing. It is because we love movies. We love the way movies make you feel. You know, when you go to those movies that just you cry in and just like, oh, or you laugh or you, you know, all that. It's like that's the kind of movies, you know, that, that, that we want to make. And, and that's what we were just trusting that instinct. And we kept, you know, we kept going and we just got kind of empowered. And from that point on, quietly, without really letting anybody at Disney know, we basically kept using the notes that made the movie better and just ignored the notes that, that were topical or this or that. It was just, we just felt like we're, we're off base. And as long as we kept showing them great, it, it kept moving in the right direction, kept going, everybody was happy. And then, and then you know, they, they, um, kept, <clears throat> they kept it really close to their chest because they didn't know if this computer animation thing would work out or not. And then, um, and then so about a year before it came out, they were looking and going, eh, this is looking like, because, because you have to understand, in hand-drawn animation, when you go from storyboards to kind of layout, to rough animation, to clean up animation, to uh, painted cells, you know, you, you could see, one kind of naturally leads into the, the other. You know, you could see the, the, you could see sort of, from the storyboards, you can pretty much see what it will be in animation. <clears throat> in computer animation, we went from, from um, storyboards to bizarre aliens landing on some other planet because all we could do was spheres for their heads and eyes bulging out and stuff. Because we knew what we were looking at, but everybody would look at it like, what happened to Woody? <laughs> Oh, that's just a stand. That's our simple geometric stand-in. Just, it's going to be witty. And they go, "It's he's weird. I understand that, but why does he look that way?" And it was just so weird. Like no one could, no one could make. I mean, I could see the the finished product as when everything we were making, but we realized no one could really see it. And so when we started seeing rendered images come through, everybody was like, "Oh, wow." This is, this is turning out to be pretty good, you know? And, and so we, we um, they, they started kind of getting excited about it, and, and we, we were going to come out on Thanksgiving. And um, it's a, gr a, great, it a great story about this, too, though, where they, they, they waited a long time to talk to any toy company. Now, and she, as, as you've heard, my office is full of toys. Um, I realized that, that you can work in animation. with Everybody who's, who's studying animation and, and stuff like that, it's awesome. You never have to grow up. <laughs> you can have a family. You can make a living. You can do all that, and you never have to grow up. You can be a kid your entire life. You can have toys in, in your office and all that stuff. That's what I realized was so awesome about animation. I have this huge toy collection, and I couldn't wait to have toys from uh, something we were creating. I thought, oh my goodness, that's gonna be so much fun. But they never, they kept waiting and waiting and waiting to talk to toy companies. So by the time they did, it was about this year in advance, they, they called, they, they, they called um, I love to say this, Hasbro and, and Mattel both passed on making toys for Toy Story. <laughs> and I, I work with both companies today, but I always remind them of that. <laughs> and, <laughs> And, and so they, they call, they, there's this one tiny little toy company out of Toronto, Canada called Thinkway Toys. The owner's name is Albert Chan. And he, um, so they called him and said, would you like to make, be a master toy licensee for this new movie? And he goes, yes. Hey, we haven't told you what the movie is. He goes, I don't care. I'm in. <laughs> and so he, he flew to Pixar and it was January of 1995. It, we're coming out in, in Thanksgiving of 1995. So it was less than a year. We talked to him, and he, he sees the movie, and then he basically says, and back in those days, um, you know, the, the, I grew up on the full-size G.I. Joes. That's why Buzz Lightyear is the height he is. He's 12 inches high. And, and, but, but they weren't making... Those, those toys didn't exist in, in stores at that time. If, if they were all, you know, the Star Wars action figures, about the six-inch high... 
you know, all those. That, that was really the standard action figure at that time. And so he came in, he was pitching. We're going to do a set of, of a to, you know, Toy Story toys of six-inch action figures. This will be great. The, you know, and they were very clever, and they did all sorts of fun stuff and all like that. And I go, but where's the full-size Buzz Lightyear? He goes, well, there's no market for a 12-inch action figure. If I was a kid in the theater looking up and seeing Andy playing with the toys, that's the toy I would want. Not a six-inch version, but the big one. And he goes, but there's no market for him. I go, I don't know the toy industry, but I know <laughs> the little boy in me is saying, I want the big Buzz Lightyear. <laughs> and he said, well, how about we go 10 inches? I go, I would want the big Buzz Lightyear. <laughs> And Albert looked across the table at me, I'll never forget. He looked at me long and hard. He says, okay, I believe in you. I'll make a 12-inch Buzz Lightyear and a 15-inch Woody pull string doll that talks. And I go, great. And, 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 and I'm still gonna do the six-inch action figures. I go, go ahead and do those. I, I got the big <laughs> size. So, so he was so smart, he recognized that we were the first computer animated feature film. That meant our characters were in, in a digital format. So he took our data, went over and did a computer milling of all of the parts and, and made the, the, the tooling of the toys from the actual data, from and the that, computer and animation. And that was how he could do it that fast. Though. Yeah, and he yeah. did it. And so one month he turned around and prototype of Buzz Lightyear, and I could not believe I was holding Buzz Lightyear in my hand. It was amazing. And I remember, I said, Albert, come with me. And so I just walked into the screening room where I knew a review was going on, and I didn't say a word. I just held up Buzz Lightyear <laughs> in my hand. <laughs> the place went nuts. And I remember Eben Ospie, who, who modeled Buzz Lightyear, he, he walked over all of the couches, all the way down from the front, beeline, and just took it and held it, and <laughs> tears were rolling down his uh -huh. eyes. We couldn't believe it. So they went around, and so they had, had this beautiful prototype we blessed of, of Buzz Lightyear and Woody with a pull string, and it worked. It was awesome. It was great. They went around, um, and, and, and stores just wouldn't, the retailers wouldn't buy it. And so in all of North America, he got sold, placed, um, for delivery in, in, you know, in November, only 60,000 Buzz Lightyears and 45,000 Woody Dolls. It sounds like a lot, but it's nothing for all of North America, Canada, and the U.S. So he believed in the movie enough and believed in us so much that he invested his own money to make another extra 250,000 Woody's and Buzz Lightyears, and they were in a warehouse ready for reorders. He believed in the reorders. The toys hit the... Hit the the shelves of stores um, about two weeks before the movie opens. From the advertising alone, all the toys got sold out a week before the movie opens. The reorders for Buzz Lightyear's in the week following the opening of the movie was 1.6 million Buzz Lightyear's <laughs> and 1.4 and a half million Woody dolls. Albert says that you know you have a hit toy when in January the stores reorder, because 60% of all toys are sold during the holiday season. So he got, re he, every year since then, in January, he's gotten massive reorders of Buzz Lightyear. He's now made over 35 million Buzz Lightyears, 12 inch Buzz Lightyears. <laughs> and, but I think, I, I think it goes, you know, everybody, there's a certain level of, of, you know, we all, we all have a personal, like Michael, I know, you have a personal level of satisfaction, of, of, of creative satisfaction, of uh, job well done, you know, and everybody, it's different, you know, in the film industry, it's like opening week in box office, it's Academy Awards, it's all that. To me... It is really um, represented by deeply entertaining audience. And, and there's two stories. One, five days after the movie comes out, I'm traveling with my family. We went down, I had heard that Disney was doing a, a very small Toy Story parade at the Disney 
Hollywood Studio, Disney MGM Studios back then in, in, in Orlando. And I said, I'm gonna see that. And so we you know, packed up the, the kids, they were all little at that time, and we flew down there. And we saw it, it was great. And we were flying home. <clears throat> and we got off the airplane in Dallas, um, in the Dallas-Fort Worth airport. And as we got off, there was a little boy and his mom. And the dad was at the back of the plane, and they were in the front of the plane. They got off, and they were waiting for the dad. And the little boy was holding a Woody the Cowboy doll. Mm -hmm. And my son, Dad, Dad, look! <laughs> <laughs> and it was like, it was so moving to me. To, and I stopped and looked at this little boy's face. And at that moment, I realized this character doesn't belong to me anymore. For four years, I labored over this character and, and bring it to life. This character now belongs to him. Mm -hmm. And the look on his face, he was so excited to show his dad this Woody the Cowboy doll that he had. And I'll never forget that little boy's face. Every single day of my life in work, I think of that little boy's face. And I go, that's why we do what we do. And, you know, and now it's like making Frozen and seeing all the little girls dressed up as Anna and Elsa, mm -hmm. seeing all the incredible YouTube videos of them singing Let It Go, um, <laughs> walking, through, walking through the airports. You know, I see, you know, I remember seeing this little boy with a Lightning McQueen rolling suitcase. He could, he could barely walk, but he was not going to let his parents. He was real slow, but there was no way they were going to, you know, carry the buzz light. I remember a little boy holding a die cast Lightning McQueen and Mater and going through security and, and they were metal and so they let they had him and they put it he put him in a tray and he kind of put him in there and they put it through the thing and he was so scared and he kind of <laughs> ran through the other side and waited for them to come out. And you know these these are the most precious moments to me and I think my most precious possession that I have I've won two, two Academy Awards, two Student Academy Awards, Emmys, you know, won all these awards, which are fantastic. The Golden Lion from the Venice Film Festival, that was really awesome. But, uh, <laughs> but um, hands down, my, my most prized possession was this, this package that came from Walt Disney World. It was from the guest relations desk, you know, in, in the Magic Kingdom, in the, 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 the City Hall there, where you, you go in. And it came with a letter, and I opened it up, and it was this Woody doll that was so worn out, just completely worn out. The fabric, it was dirty, the hat was gone, one boot was gone completely, and it was so beat up, and like the, the legs had been sewn on, had it been three or four times, right? And and it, the letter said that a little boy named Caleb, who was six years old, came into the city hall today and gave us his old Woody doll. You see, his parents bought him a new Woody doll. And he wanted his, I'm gonna get choked up. He wanted his old Woody doll to have a great new home. So he, he was leaving it with them to be with Buzz Lightyear for infinity and beyond. Mm. Yeah. And I, mean, I, I get tear, I just broke down crying when I read this. I get, I, look at me, I'm a mess. I mean, <laughs> even just telling the story again, every time I get choked up because it's like, that's arguably the greatest illustration of why I do what I do, why we at Pixar and Disney Animation do what we do, why what you can do in your life. Uh, and it's what Sullivan's Travels mm. told me. It's what, what, what you know, Preston Sturgis created there, that notion of deeply entertaining audiences to the point where, you know, something really touches them. You know, it, 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 it's, it's, so, it's so profound when you can achieve that, you know? And it's done through, through incredible creativity, incredible risk, and belief in oneself, and belief in the process, and belief in each other. 
you know, in, in, the, in the creative process that we, we developed. Um, Steve Jobs, I remember um, he was like my brother, and we worked together for 25 years, and he, um, I remember when we were working really hard on Toy Story, and it was tough. We were working long hours and really trying to figure this out and invent it and, and get the story working right and all that stuff. And then he decided <clears throat> that he was going to take the company Pixar public, a public stock offering, the week after Toy Story comes out. And I was like, oh, Steve, <laughs> it's hard enough making a good movie. Don't bet. He was betting the entire company on Toy Story. And I was like, oh, my God. So he took me out to dinner. We talked a long time. And we walked down, and we were standing on the curb. It was his favorite Japanese restaurant in San Francisco, and we were sitting there, or we were standing on the curb. And we talked for about an hour and a half on that curb. And I remember he said, you know, when, when he hadn't gone back to Apple at that time. And he said, you know, back when I was at Apple, when we were making computers, the lifespan of our computer um, was about three years. So in five years, it's literally a doorstop. He said, but if you do your job right, what you create can last forever. And that was, that was typical Steve, right, in the sense that he was looking way beyond everybody else and recognizing this. And I, th I started thinking about what he said, and I was like, you know, he's right. Name another movie that was released in 1938 that's watched today as much as Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. Or frankly, any year that a Disney movie comes out, I guarantee you that's the most watched film. And will be for generations to come. And, and he was right. You know, there's something really special about animation. That if you do it right, it really does last forever. It, and, and I see that in our own films of our, our DVDs. They, 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 there's no way that they can, they have stats for everything in, 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 in our business, but they don't have a stat for once a DVD or now, you know, online or whatever, how many times our movies are watched in people's homes. You know, but I just, I hear about it with families and just, mm -hmm. you know, um, when we were making Toy Story, our boys were really young. And I remember clear as the day she said it, Nancy, the boys wanted to watch something, and it was terrible. But they loved <laughs> it, and they wanted to watch it again and again and again and again and again. And she's putting this VHS tape in there, looking at me, and she said, make sure that you don't make Toy Story for the first time someone sees it. Oh. But for the 100th time, a parent has to suffer through it on video. And, and it was, it was, um, and, I, and I, I laughed so hard, just like you did. And it, but she was so right. And it's like that, her statement, and then what Steve was saying is, is, is what we strive for. You know, it's something you don't mind. And I hear it from parents and all like that. It's like, you know, oh, some movie, you know, they're watching some movie and the kids and they, they're cleaning or they're doing something and they look and they watch it and the next thing you know, they're standing behind the couch. They kind of <laughs> sit down at the couch and they're there until the movie's over again. And they've seen it all, you know. And, you know, we, we just, we just, it's why we do what we do.